Lam Hoy, better known to her fellow peers at the University of British Columbia and popular culture at large as Elisa Lam was a bright, thoughtful, and imaginative student. Her interests in fashion and talents for writing were weighed down by the unfortunate demons of bipolar disorder and mental suppression, clouding the circumstances that most assume led to her initial vanishing and tragic death. Amateur slinks and professional investigators have spent the better part of almost six years digging theoretical tunnel and holding magnifying glasses up to anything and everything that might shed the one decisive clue in the ultimate reason behind Lisa Lamb's demise. These probes and prusals combined with assorted observational evidence have only created headaches more than they've solved questions, leaving the uncracked mystery up for grabs by anyone willing to tackle such a brain-bending mind twister as a hope to provide a more substantial reasoning built upon observable evidence and situational analysis. This is an examination of the bizarre circumstances surrounding Elisa Lamb's confusing death. Elisa Lamb was born on April the 30th, 1991, in Vancouver, British Columbia, to two immigrants from Hong Kong, David and Yina Lam. Her parents opened up a restaurant in Burnaby, Canada, and the family helped operate the popular dining spot called Paul's Restaurant for years. In 2010, Elisa started her first blog on the internet titled Other Fields. Throughout the next couple of years, she used the platform to showcase her love for fashion and clothing, often posting magazine articles and fashion-related photography. She also would openly speak about her struggles with mental illness, constantly fearing her transcript would show her frequently dropped classes and sporadic college attendance. However, she also wrote honestly about her thoughts and ideas about psychology, emotion, and the human spirit. Throughout these blocks, she kept records of her own musings while sharing stories that reflected a bright mind and an intelligent thinker. Writing in a final blog on Ethafields, Alyssa announced that she would be transferring her energy and social media presence to Tumblr starting a page titled Naval Navo, translated as News New. On her page, Alyssa shared thousands of and pieces of writing, both her own and of various authors. It was apparent on Tumblr that she held deep-rooted interests in classical books and films, experimental art and design, and fashion and culture. Sprinkled amongst these fascinating were bits of dark, brooding images, hinting at a more personal sadness and a conflicted mind full of monsters, melancholy, and misery. In fact, Elisa did have a history with a couple of psychological disorders. This narrative kept under wraps by her family for months after her disappearance and death. Specifically, she was diagnosed for bipolar disorder and depression. Bipolar disorder is a mental ill that causes depression itself in addition to instances of abnormal and elevated mood called mania or hypomania. To treat these disorders, Elisa took multiple medications such as dextrine, wellbutrin, and mood stabilizers. For most of her life, Elisa functioned without major ramifications as a result of these struggles. And until the fateful trip to Los Angeles in 2013, she had shown zero signs of breakdown or danger to both herself and others. Despite these character characteristics, it's important to remember Elisa Lam as a human being just as we all are. She was a promising student at the University of British Columbia and obviously had author of ideas about the world. She had a family, a faction of hobbies, and most importantly, a future. Unfortunately, it was cut short of her potential as the mystery of her fate began to unravel in December of 2012. On December the 21st, 2012, Elisa gives the first recorded mention of her desire to travel to the West Coast and visit a school in Santa Clara for potential transfer. But a week later on December the 28th, Alyssa mentions on Tumblr that her cell phone has been misplaced. After the new year, on January the 5th, 2013, Elisa mentions planning for her West Coast tour and for the first time suggests meeting up with people via the internet. A couple of days later on January the 7th, Elisa books her flight for the West Coast tour and tacks on a very eerie message regarding the future on Tumblr. Then on January the 9th, Elisa posts on Tumblr that due to paranoia, she has made a new Facebook account for the fifth time and reposts a blurb she had written earlier that day before the blurb is an introduction in which she claims, this is the very start of my depression and today I'm feeling very low. Fast forward to January the 18th when Elisa supposedly arrives in Vancouver on her tour. 
For days later on January the 22nd, she supposedly travels to San Diego for the first leg in her journey after missing her initial flight while getting lost in the airport. On January the 24th, Elisa posts on Tumblr that her trip so far has consisted mostly of activities and actions that she participates in back at home on a normal schedule. With this post, she hints at her later actions in Los Angeles. When she says every now and then, I do something entirely impulsive and reckless. A few days later on January the 27th, she posts again on Tumblr that she was out with friends at a speakeasy and had in fact lost another phone. Although this time it did not belong to her, instead she had borrowed her friend's old Blackberry for her trip. The next day, January the 28th, Elisa arrives in LA and checks into the Seaswell Hotel near Skid Row, a budget motel for tourists in the city. On January the 30th, Elisa's anonymous roommates complain of her odd behavior, and she is moved to a private room on the fifth floor so that she isn't a disturbance to other guests. On January the 31st, the last day of a planned visit in Los Angeles, Elisa is seen for the last time by a couple of anonymous hotel workers. And then finally, by a clerk Katie Orphan at the local bookstore, Katie mentions Elisa was by herself, but also outgoing, very lively, and very friendly. Orphan also says that she was talking about what book she was getting and whether or not what she was getting would be too heavy for her to carry around as she traveled. Because Elisa was supposed to check out of the Cecil Hotel that day and travel to Santa Cruz for the last leg on her tour, both her parents were waiting for a phone call. In fact, Elisa had called her parents almost every night during her trip despite losing her temporary cell phone. After they heard nothing from their daughter, Mr. and Mrs. Lamb flew to Los Angeles to file a missing persons report and assist the Los Angeles Police Department in their search. Throughout the first week of February, both the Lamb couple and Ollie PD scoured the Cecil and the surrounding areas for any trace of Elisa. Police dogs were unable to pick up on her scent, and for the first few days, no clues were uncovered. Elisa's room that she stayed in prior to her disappearance was void of any suspicious items or sign of disturbances, an unsettling occurrence for such a strange vanishing. On February the 6th, the LAPD released an official statement online regarding Elisa Lamb's disappearance and details surrounding the case, urging citizens to keep an eye out for her profile. A day later, they hold a press conference on February the 7th but again received no leads or calls from the general public. Then on February the 14th, LAPD releases the biggest bombshell in the entire case. An elevator surveillance clip from February the 1st showing Elisa Lamb walk in the elevator, press a series of buttons, and proceed to act in a bizarre manner. The clip was unsettling to say the least but gave investigators one more glimpse into Lamb's final sighting and brought the case to worldwide interests. The missing person search would soon come to an end, however, when on February the 19th, Cecil Hotel workers responded to multiple guest complaints about funny-smelling water and low faucet pressure. The employee went up to the rooftop water system, peered into an open tank, and discovered Elisa Lamb's naked body floating face up. LAPD was immediately notified, and the water tank soon became a crime scene. A couple of days thereafter, on February the 21st, the Los Angeles coroner's office issued a label of Lamb's demise as accidental due to the consequence of drowning, with bipolar disorder as a finding of other conditions contributing but not related to the immediate cause of death. In June of 2013, the full coroner's report along with the toxic results were released to the public as well. While not revealing any massive twist to the mystery, it did note that Elisa Lamb's body was indeed found naked, with her clothes also found in the water tank, discovered in a sandy particulate, along with her keys and watch. From here on out, thousands of theories, hypotheticals, conspiracies, and simple casual conversations have been discussed through the following months and years. Nobody seems to want to stick by the ally coroner's office and their findings. Many questioned the police investigation and even more saw possible holes in their final court. Regardless, the timeline of Elisa Lamb's death and its direct series of events blossomed into the most talked about case of the 21st century. Without a doubt, the most controversial and scrutinized piece of the Elisa Lamb's case is the four-minute CCTV footage that the Ally PD pulled from one of Cecil Hotel's surveillance tapes situated in the upper corner of a main elevator carriage in the Northern Corridor. Before we dive into its content, let's watch the main portion of the video. 
Be warned the following images are unsettling and could be viewed as sensitive material. The video is a bit grainy, and segments of it are hard to clearly make out. But one thing is for certain, Elisa Lam is the subject of the footage and is clearly reacting to something. Now, what that something is will probably never be accounted for with 100% certainty, but it sure does make the clip that much stranger. It really makes you wonder, is Elisa appearing out of the elevator with the sense that she's been followed? One could argue she's talking out loud at certain points, possibly just to herself. Between the random buttons pressed upon her entrance to the emptiness of the hallways, to the undistinguished hand gestures and body positions she makes, the rhyme and reason to the video is impossible to explain upon the first watch. There has also been some controversy revolving around the tape's origins. Some people across the internet claim the footage skips one minute of the timecode, but because of its low quality, it's not easy to point out. Others say that the footage itself has been tampered with purposefully pixelating Elise's mouth at various points, but these reports have been either denied or flat-out ignored by professionals. One thing is for sure, the elevator footage from February the 1st, 2013. Depicting the last known images Elisa Lam have conjured both worthy concern and far-fetched conspiracies and remains the single most interesting piece of evidence linked to the entire case. Since the day Elisa Lam went missing, the CCTV tapes were released and her body was discovered on the rooftop of the Cecil Hotel. Countless theories have been proposed across the internet and publications all over the world, trying to unlock the secrets of the seemingly unexplainable mystery. Many of these assumptions are based purely in conspiracy theory. Some circles have drawn up wild fantasies that explain Alyssa was playing an elevator game, attempting to cross over into alternative universes. Others believe Elisa was possessed by spiritual forces, encountered paranormal subjects, or was contacted by otherworldly beings. These farcical attempts to glamorize Elisa's death as science fiction or occultist are based upon zero observational evidence, connected by complex, coincidental claims, and hyperbole. For example, the location of the Cecil Hotel is in Skid Row of downtown Los Angeles. This area is infamous for its high crime rates and suspicious activity. Drug peddling and violent crime are common both outside and inside of the hotel, which has its own history of murder and suicide. In 1985, serial killer Richard Ramirez, dubbed as the Night Stalker, stayed in one of the 600 rooms in the midst of horrifically killing 13 women. Another homicide suspect, Jack Univiga, stayed in the hotel in 1991. It was a frequent spot for those with suicidal tendencies, seeing a few people jump from the rooftop in the 1950s and 1960s. It even housed another cold case, that of Pigeon Goldie Osgood, a former telephone operator whose mutilated body was discovered in her room in 1964 and whose death remains unsolved. Despite the criminology of the Cecil, none of it can be directly attributed to the tragic death of Elisa. A much more real explanation is that Elisa Lam was followed during her time in Los Angeles, chased in the hallways of the Cecil Hotel, and subsequently murdered and placed in the water tank by a second party. Initially, this theory made sense. If you go back to multiple Tumblr posts that Elisa made throughout the end of 2012 and beginning of 2013, she was conscious about her outspoken nature and feared that one day her mouth would get her into trouble. At various points, she wrote about unsettling anxieties. One post read, I'm going out tonight. I really hope no creeper comes near me. And twice, Elisa was convinced trouble was lurking around the corner at the fault of her tongue, saying, I really need to be removed from society before my big mouth gets in trouble and I get beaten up, as well as, my mouth is my downfall and it will get me in trouble. I already do so many stupid things. I have troubles knowing where the boundaries are, and it seems I always make the biggest mistakes at the worst possible moments and get caught and face consequences for getting caught the one time I wasn't thinking and did something stupid to cut corners. So, taking into consideration, she repeatedly sparked the fuses of strangers around her. It's plausible she did it in the wrong place at the wrong time that winter. In addition to Lisa's worries is the manner in how she acted during the elevator footage, after she enters for the first time and presses the floor buttons, she waits a few moments before quickly approaching the elevator's door frame. She then quickly sticks her head out into the hallway and glances from side to side in a hurried manner, then pulling back into the elevator. She pins herself against the wall and then into the corner, 
acting as if she was avoiding the vision of someone from outside. She goes back to the door frame once more and again cautiously sticks her head into the open. From here, she makes a series of random movements before pressing more buttons. When she returns outside for the final time, it appears as if she is communicating either orally or with her hands. Regardless, number one is seen, and Elisa disappears from view. The first part of her movement could indicate she was hiding from another person, but her random footwork and dazed demeanor in the second part of the footage just doesn't make sense if she truly was on the run. The Tumblr post concerns, combined with a suspicious video, make you wonder if there was someone involved with Elisa's death, but there are too many rebuttals to the argument that her cause of death was a homicide. For instance, there were zero bruises or signs of bodily harm on Elisa's figure, ruling out an assault. All of her belongings were accounted for besides the long-lost cell phone, ruling out robbery or attempted robbery. The eyewitness testimonies by hotel employees and the bookstore clerk claimed she was completely alone and showed no sign of struggle or distress regarding another person. Cameras captured no other suspects around the time of Elisa's recording, and her lack of relationships in a new territory helped rule out a planned or guest-dated. Murder was unlikely as Elisa had very few friends back at home, let alone in Los Angeles. In the end, there was zero evidence confirming the theories about murder or foul play, leading both the LAPD and us to rule it out. All of that being said, the official opinion of the Allied Chief Coroner and assigned medical examiners presents a catch-22. They preface their final hypothesis with a warning that the interpretation of the evidence is limited because of the small sample size, particularly the lack of blood samples tested due to low levels. However, they then contradicted themselves when they say that the police investigation ruled that foul play but also stated a full review of the circumstances of the case and appropriate consultation. Do not support intent to harm oneself. The manner of death is classified as an accident. So, if there was no harmful intention either by Lamb herself or a second suspect, then how exactly did Elisa Lamb accidentally climb up a massive cylinder, discover it was the water tank, lift up an incredibly heavy lid, and jump into the dark water? And if the lid was already opened, why did she choose to climb in as a response? Murder and suicide are polar opposites that have been deemed inapplicable. Melissa was killed by someone else. Linger over the fact that the rooftop access was protected by alarms on the doors and the fact that accessing the water tanks required agility and strength. However, it's been repeatedly explained that the hotel has four different access points to the roof, three by fire escape that have no alarms, and that the water tank lids were either opened or lighter than originally assumed, easily operated by a woman of Elisa's size. So now we must find the middle ground between the two explanations and justifiably theorize how such a specific, unsearchable set of circumstances can be regarded as an accident. The most plausible and evidential theory is that Elisa Lamb suffered from a manic episode due to her struggles with bipolar disorder both leading up to and on the day of February the 1st. To start, we must consider the toxicology reports. Two different antidepressant medicines prescribed to Elisa were either traced directly or metabolites were traced to her heart, blood, and liver enzymes. One of these drugs was bupropion, known to sometimes cause mania and bipolar disorder. Another mood-stabilizing medicine had metabolized traces to her enzymes, but Elisa's antipsychotic medicine was not found in her system. So in review, Elisa had only taken one of her prescribed medicines the day she passed, and had only taken the others recently, if not at all, in the days leading up to her death. The toxicology report also confirmed that Elisa had no alcohol in her system or other recreational drugs. This rules out the possibility that she had been under the influence of substances while on camera in the elevator, or that something such as pills or drunkenness inspired her to climb into the water tanks. Her liver was not tested for a hypnol, better known as rohypnol. There was no urine in the system, meaning she excreted any and all liquid waste urine that would contain traces of rohypnol, ketamine, or other date rape paraphernalia. Reflecting on the information regarding her history with mental disorders and the calculated prescription use and lack thereof, we must next understand what exactly an episode of mania is. Severe mania can include psychotic features such as hallucinations, delusions, paranoia, catatonia, and lack of insight. One mental health professional uses the phrase, disorganized yet appearing singularly focused, 
highlighting its occurrence when Elisa presses the buttons in the elevator at random, appearing intent on some kind of agenda or direction. Symptoms of mania also include psychomotor agitation, which involves repetitive, purposeless, or unintentional movements and behaviors. These movements and behaviors are made in response to feelings of restlessness caused by increased anxiety. Dr. Daniel Morale reviews in a medical journal that these actions can result in wringing of the hands, pacing, and taking off clothes repeatedly. All three behaviors were exhibited by Elisa both in the elevator footage and in or around the water tanks. The fact that Alita Lam attempted to the roof at all could be a response to hallucinations and or delusions. What these might have been is unknown, and it would be unfair to Elisa's memory to assume and fictionalize her mental illness. It's important to note that manic hallucinations are not just visual but can be manifestations of sound, smell, taste, and touch, another possible explanation for her removal of clothing. In combination with the inconsistent prescription upkeep, the pure fact that Elisa was in a foreign location with a lack of communication back home could have set off a manic episode. The people Elisa had been staying with since she booked a shared room with fellow guests stated that Elisa was acting strangely, to the point she was bothering the others and had to be moved to another room by herself. The additional trigger of isolation could have initiated mania, as well as playing a role in why she was by herself for the remainder of her time in LA. The last bit of promising evidence supporting this theory is a testimony received by us from a confidential resident, to be referenced as Resident A from Los Angeles, California, who wishes for both them and their family to be kept anonymous. After hearing about our investigation into the case of Elisa Lam and having little to no prior knowledge of this scenario, Resident A told us that a few years ago, they had a family member in Mexico commit suicide as a result of manic depression or bipolar disorder. Resident A stated that this family member died from drowning after plunging into the death of a similar industrial water tank. Resident A also stated that this was a common occurrence for the family member, who was a result of their bipolar disorder, seeks out bodies of water whenever suffering from a bout of mania. Resident A confirmed that this family member was about 35 years old when they passed away but had been suffering from mental illness for over a decade and had an inclination to run away and find attraction to water throughout the years. While this case has no direct relation to Elisa Lam, it's peculiar that both instances involve a confined bipolar subject who, as a result of their condition, drowned because of an unconscious gravitation to water. There is hardly any research done in the medical or psychological field regarding this phenomena, but we are incredibly interested if there are other situations like this one. If anything, it further confirms that Elise's reason for selecting the Cecil Hotel's water tank to not be a mystery but a tragic symptom of her psychological illness. In the end, taking all evidence, scientific research, and societal patterns into account, we've determined that the initial report from the chief coroner is accurate. In that, Alicia Lamb died accidentally due to drowning as an indirect result of bipolar disorder. While other theories were briefly discussed, their complete lack in observational evidence and origins from make-believe prevented them from serious consideration. The reason this case fascinates followers all over the world and produced incessant gossip and conspiracies is the fact that it's hard for people to accept simple innocent explanations for complex and unsettling situations. Psychological disorders are heavily stigmatized but also very misunderstood. People do not want to accept that Elisa Lam was suffering from hallucinations due to bipolar disorder because that's only in her mind, and they struggle to accept such distinctions. Instead, it's much easier to tell our own versions of what we want to have happened, something far more fantastical or intriguing than mental illness. For example, people believe another party was involved because Lam's cell phone was missing, and her tumbler remained active for months following her death. Yet the simple answer is her original phone was lost weeks before her trip, and Tumblr will populate active accounts with posts and the likeness of their previous content for a brief time after they go dark. People also couldn't wrap their brains around the fact that Elisa made it to the rooftop and into the water tanks undetected. However, it's quite simply laid out in the Undisputed Material Facts and Supporting Evidence section of the Motion for Summary Judgment document after the Cecil Hotel was sued for its role in Elisa's death. In Box 10, it states that the rooftop access door is equipped with an electronic alarm system, which alerts hotel employees when the rooftop access door has been opened, 
followed by box 14, which states that the alarm for the rooftop access door was not activated at any point in January or February 2013. This means that Elisa used one of the three fire escapes to reach the rooftop, proven possibly by an intentional guest at the Cecil Hotel via a YouTube demonstration. In addition, the motion for summary judgment reports in Box 20 that someone could theoretically access the water tank by climbing to the top of an elevator utility room and jumping down upon the water tank from above. This photo depicts the elevator utility room in question, which allows easy access from a red set of stairs and a joined ladder. The leap from that structure to the water tanks is also quite negligible as seen put to scale with the size of a human portrayed here. In terms of the elevator video, our story-centric minds want to fill in the hallways on either side of that elevator full of monsters, perpetrators, and supernatural phenomena. But in reality, there was nothing of the sort the night of February the 1st, 2013. Only Elisa Lamb truly knows what she saw and what she felt the day she died, and it's up to us to trust that it was the unfortunate unpredictability of mental illness that caused those emotions and the resulting actions. After all, Elisa was a young woman who had recently gone through intense emotional roller coasters with an identity crisis and building anxieties revolving around her purpose. She was somewhat aware of this impending depression and admitted online that she could tell she was leaning towards impulsive and reckless tendencies after the fact, a glaring sign of potential mania. She was about the age that many young people start to experience what are called breakthrough symptoms of both bipolar spectrum and schizophrenia spectrum tendencies. The unfamiliar surroundings of Skid Row in Los Angeles, potential insomnia, mixed with an absence of proper medicine compounded her confusion and eventual mania. There is no single ruling factor that led to Elisa Lamb's harrowing misfortunate death. Instead, it was a combination of nature and circumstance heightened by coincidental video recordings that cultivated a gross amount of inconsiderate internet conspiracy. Let this examination of the bizarre circumstances surrounding Elisa Lamb's death be a step in the process of ending stigmatization around struggles with disorder and mental illness in general. Elisa was a beautiful human being with unlimited potential. She had interests, hobbies, and dislikes like all of us do. She has a family who still honor her memory. It's time for us to do the same and take lessons from her illustration. Look after those with mental health issues and speak up about it before it creates another confusing saga like that of Elisa. Duke Pearson, 31-year-old Dorothy Fielding went missing in August 1967. Her body was found buried in a shallow grave eight months later near the Seven Mile Vehicle Park in Spokane, Washington State. 47-year-old Ruby Lampson was reported missing in June 1967, but her remains were not found until 1971. The shallow grave where she had been hidden was also in the Seven Mile Park, not far from Dorothy's grave. In September of the same year, a suicide was reported by Duke Pearson, who was a sheriff's deputy at the time. His wife, 33-year-old Sandra Pearson, was found dead in a car at their family home. Her body was inside the vehicle in the garage. Tin foil had been stuffed into the exhaust pipe before a connecting hose had been fed through the car's rear window. The ignition was armed, then the fuel tank was at least half full. The garage was filled with fumes, but strangely, the engine was not running. This so-called suicide happened three months after Ruby's disappearance and just one month after Dorothy's. Sandra was five months pregnant and left behind her other two children. In April 2018, the Major Crimes Unit received a tip from someone who said that Dorothy used to be a member of the Falls View Taven bowling team. It turned out that Ruby was also a member, and the two women were friends. It was also rumored that at the time, Dorothy was having an affair with Duke Pearson. Pearson worked for the Sheriff's Office from 1959 until 1966 when he abruptly quit his job. His colleagues stated that his attitude and behavior became unstable. He even threatened to kill one co-worker who asked why he wasn't coming into work anymore. All three cold cases were reopened, and Pearson was questioned in April 2018. Although he denied ever knowing Dorothy or Ruby, following further investigation, detectives were finally able to get an arrest warrant 51 years after the crimes had been committed. They made a move to arrest Pearson on the 25th of January 2019 only to find that the 85-year-old had died three days earlier. Henry McCabe, 
32-year-old Henry McCabe worked as an auditor in Minnesota and was described as an outgoing and open man. He had two children whom he adored and a happy marriage. And the only thing that seemed to be a bit off in his life were reports that some recent bad reviews at work had taken place. On Labor Day, September the 7th, 2015, Henry spent the night out with friends, drinking and having fun at a club. Henry's friend, William Kennedy, claimed he dropped Henry off at a gas station convenience store, Super America, that night near his home after they'd finished partying and that he'd taken Henry's keys from him while another friend took his wallet to stop him buying more drinks. Reportedly, Henry was in a bad state from drinking too much alcohol. He was last seen alive around 2 a.m. However, when police found that neither Kennedy nor his car were on CCTV that night, they questioned his story about what happened on September the 7th. Kennedy then clarified that he dropped Henry off at a different gas station, a holiday gas station, and this was verified by surveillance footage. That night at around 2.23 a.m., Henry's wife, who was in California at the time, received an unsettling phone call from her husband. His garbled message consisting of screams, moans, and gurgling sounds heard over the line is chilling to say the least. Henry reportedly says he's been shot and after a short silence, a voice yells stop it. One news outlets reported that Henry also left a voicemail on his brother's phone, but it is unknown what the voicemail contains. Henry had been dropped off just 20 minutes before the call, and it is not understood exactly what happened in that period of time that led to the disturbing voicemail. His mobile phone was disconnected shortly after the call. Two months later on November the 2nd, a kayak uncovered the 32-year-old's body in Rush Lake. At around 4.30 p.m., there were no cuts to his body nor any wounds of any kind, including bullet wounds. So why did Henry claim he had been shot? He was found six miles from the gas station where he was dropped off and police said his body had been there in the water for a long time. The Ramsey County autopsy report claimed that Henry had likely died from drowning in fresh waters, and authorities say there's nothing suspicious about the death. But how does this account for the disturbing voicemail? There are certainly more questions than answers in the case of Henry McCabe. And while many believe he simply drowned by accident, no theory seems to answer the question of the graphic voicemail. Suzanne Lyle, better known to her friends, family, and co-workers as Susie, was an extremely intelligent, thoughtful, and compassionate human. Her interest in technology and talents for computer science were cut short by an unexplainable, untraceable vanishing in March of 1998, leaving all who knew her, both in life and through the world wide web, grasping for answers in a sea of evidence that drowned us all in doubt. Amateur sleuths and professional investigators have spent the better part of almost two decades digging theoretical tunnels, holding magnifying glasses up to anything and everything that might shed that one decisive clue in the ultimate reasons behind Susie's disappearance. These probes and pursuits, combined with assorted observable evidence, have only created headaches more than they've solved questions, leaving the uncracked mystery up for grabs for anyone willing to tackle it as I hope to provide a more substantial reasoning built upon observable evidence and situational analysis. This is an examination of the disappearance of Suzanne Lyle. Suzanne Lyle was born on April the 6th, 1978, in Saratoga Springs, New York. She was the youngest of three siblings to parents Doug and Mary, who hadn't planned for a third child but welcomed Susie into their world. Susie was a quiet, shy, yet unbelievably introspective young girl. Growing up close to her older brother, Stefan, Susie would stick to herself at school instead of forming many social relationships. However, she nonetheless had a deep understanding of human nature and wrote poetry in her notebooks, so passionate that she would jump out in the middle of a shower with the water still on and run into a room just to jot down her latest inspiration. This sensitivity and dedication soon bled into the realm of science and technology where Susie would research all day and build machines and trinkets from scratch by night. In high school, Susie discovered her love for computers and, by extension, the internet. As a teenager, Susie would form virtual friendships with other tech lovers on message boards, eventually joining a computer club in the nearby town coffee shop. It was at these informal meetings where Susie met her long boyfriend, Richard Condon, a fellow intellectual and computer whiz. Over the next few years, Susie and Richard grew very close. Even after he left high school a couple of years before she did, 
Susie maintained a romantic relationship with Richard despite their age difference. In 1996, Susie finally graduated from the local high school and attended the State University of New York at Oneonta to officially study computer science. However, just a year at Oneonta proved to be too easy for Susie as her coursework wasn't challenging her actual level of intelligence. To increase her studies, Susie transferred to the State University of New York at Albany, or Sunny Albany for short. Doug and Mary believed that Susie had actually transferred to be closer to Richard, who lived much closer to Albany. Doug described Richard as being very mature for his age, and Mary felt that he had been a little controlling in regards to his relationship with Susie. It didn't affect Susie's independence, though, as she worked two off-campus jobs at local computer stores, including a Babbager's game shop at the local Crossgate Mall in Gilderland, New York. As time passed through the winter of 1998, all seemed normal to Susie and the rest of the Lyle family. Doug and Mary were happy as empty nesters with three children achieving their goals and moving on to greater things. Susie was balancing classes with work, a relationship, and, of course, her passion for computers. Everything proceeded smoothly despite the occasional school-related stress until March of 1998 brought an unexpected gloom and doom, not just to Susie Lyle but to her family and friends as well. Sometime during the years of 1993 or 1994, Susie meets up with her boyfriend, Richard Condon, on the internet and joins his computer club at a local New York State coffee shop. They soon enter a relationship while both in high school that lasts for the next few years. At various points in the next few years, Susie and Richard's relationship fluctuates, almost breaking apart during a few unstable moments but never creating a hostile or harsh situation. In the summer of 1997, Susie transfers to a state university in Oneonta to sunny Albany to engage in more demanding courses and supposedly be closer to Richard. Later that year in the autumn of 1997, Susie supplements her in with a couple of jobs. Not long after the turn of the new year in the winter of 1998, Susie tells an anonymous co-worker at the mall that she feels as if she's being stalked by someone she doesn't recognize. Susie shows little fear or anxiety despite the hunch and never reveals further details to either the co-worker or her family. On Valentine's Day, Susie's mother, Mary, drives to Richard's house in the afternoon for a quick stop. Mary theorizes that Susie was delivering a Dear John letter as preparation for a final breakup. She concludes that Susie's tension increased as a result of seeing someone else. Who this someone could be was unknown. Throughout the remaining days of February 1998, Susie goes to work at Babich's under immense stress from upcoming exams, often appearing uptight and in a variety of moods around her boss at the shop. On March the 1st of that year, Mary talks to Susie for the last time. Mary recalls Susie being concerned about finances and waiting for the next paycheck to arrive. Mary attempts to offer a bit of money to her daughter, but Susie declines the proposal. On the morning of March the 2nd, Susie completes the big exam she had been anxious about in the preceding weeks. Either right before or right after the exam on the same fateful day, Susie withdraws her usual $20 from an ATM machine located near the bus terminal at Collins Circle, the normal stop for Susie before she leaves for work. Later in the afternoon on the 2nd, Susie makes another uncharacteristic ATM withdrawal at about the same time her shift at Babbage starts in Crossgate Mall at a machine located near the store again, in the amount of $20. Moments later, when Susie actually clocks in for work at 4 p.m., she appears more like her average self, much calmer than she'd been in the months of February, at least according to her manager. At about 8 p.m. on the 2nd, the manager of Babbage leaves for the day, leaving Susie to finish up her shift per usual. Everything is how it should be, but unknowingly to the manager, this is the last time he'll make contact with her. Around an hour later, at 9.20 p.m., a nighttime security guard at the backlit of Crossgate's mall cannot confirm with 100% certainty that he saw Susie Lyle leave the store, but does mention that nothing was out of the ordinary. Even though the employee exit area was poorly lit, it's understood that at that time, Susie boarded a Capital District Transportation Authority bus headed towards campus profile by the bus driver at the time. This is the last confirmed sighting of Suzanne Lyle before her disappearance. After a 25-minute commute at 9.45 p.m., the bus makes its scheduled stop at Collins Circle. The driver at the time could not remember if Susie had exited, 
though a friend of hers claimed she saw her get off the bus and walk away. This would be the last unconfirmed sighting of Suzanne. The next morning on March the 3rd, Susie's boyfriend, Richard, makes a call to her parents informing them that he never received a call or email from Susie the night before after returning from work and couldn't reach contact with her. Just a few hours passed by before Doug and Mary contact Sunny Albany Campus Police to officially announce that Susie is missing. The campus police do not immediately react, however, and say periods of absence for college students are common. One of the officers attended Susie's next class to look for her, but she never arrives. At 4 p.m. on March the 3rd, Mary has the idea to call Susie's bank and inquire about her spending history. The bank reveals that Susie's bank account had been accessed at an undisclosed ATM machine a minute before Mary's phone call. The amount taken was Susie's normal withdrawal of $20, but the location wouldn't be known until the next day. The morning of March the 4th, Susie's bank calls Mary again to inform her that the location of the ATM transaction came through. It was recorded by a machine at Stewart's Shop Convenience Store in Albany, a few miles away from campus, and in a part of town rarely visited by Susie. When the mail arrives later on March the 4th, Mary Lyle discovers a birthday card from none other than Susie herself. It seems like a normal gesture, but the timing is certainly peculiar and a bit unsettling, as Susie included a note that said, See you soon, inside the card. On March the 5th, after attending another one of Susie's classes in which she was unaccounted for, the case had become an anomaly compared to most missing student profiles and calls in New York State Police to assist in the impending search. In the following weeks during heavy police investigation, Richard Condon is interviewed but quickly understood as innocent. Richard provides an alibi for the night of March the 2nd in which he was playing video games with another friend. Police also interview the bus driver on Susie's route to and from work who says he remembered Susie getting on the bus in the evening and was certain she didn't get off at the last stop at night, but wasn't sure if she did indeed exit the bus at Collins Circle. A few weeks of analysis of the ATM withdrawal also lead police to unrelated security camera footage of an unidentified man shopping at Stewart's Shop Convenience Store around the time of Susie's account usage. The man was wearing a ball cap and jacket and a sketch of his face was shown to the public, his profile titled The Nike Man. In May of 1998, authorities discover Susie's name tag from Babbage in a parking lot on the sunny campus 90 feet from the bus stop. However, it's never determined how long the tag had been lying there and police recover zero traces of DNA or other forensics. Later that year, the supposed Nike man from the police sketch comes forward and cooperates with investigators, in which he is interviewed regarding the events of March the 3rd. His story removes any suspicion and is quickly dropped as either a witness or suspect. Despite endless searches and efforts over the next 20 years, no new evidence or leads turn up. The most recent development in the case is in 2016 when Mary Lyle teams up with local experts in detailed underwater mapping after she repeatedly felt odd feelings while driving over the Crescent Bridge on top of Mohawk River. Unfortunately, nothing of significance is reported, and the disappearance of Suzanne Lyle remains cold as of this moment. When dissecting the entire case, the most scrutinized and heavily referenced pieces of evidence are the ATM withdrawals and the complete mystery regarding who exactly accessed the machine, with both Susie's debit card and the respective personal identification number. The most glaring detail with this case point is the time in which it happened. Somebody accessed Susie's account well after she was last seen. This alone makes little sense. If Susie was robbed and then kidnapped, why would the culprit wait almost 24 hours before actually using her debit card? It's been clarified that only two people knew the exact PIN for the bank account, which was Susie herself and Richard, her boyfriend. However, while this seems suspicious on the surface, it wouldn't take too much coercion for a kidnapper or perpetrator to obtain the information from Susie if she was held captive. That's not the only strange aspect of the ATM ordeal, though. Doug and Mary Lyle were certain the location of the ATM at an Albany convenience store in a different part of the town was nowhere near the usual route Susie took to either work or leisure activities. It wasn't a popular place for purchases made by fellow Sunny students either. The clerk of Stewart's shop did not recognize Susie's picture and didn't remember seeing her on March the 3rd or any day prior. 
Police thought they had the ATM mini mystery solved when they viewed CCTV footage at Stewart's shop and noticed a suspicious figure who walked inside of the store around the same time the ATM machine was operated under Susie's account. This spawned that Nike man, suspect, and conspiracy theories but ended up being nothing more than circumstantial theory and rumored racial profiling. Of course, the frustrating part about the CCTV footage and the ATM use is the fact that the cameras do not actually cover the ATM machine itself. Instead, they are positioned above the counter inside of the store. Thus, anyone can use the ATM without exposing their identity. This adds a wrinkle in Susie's case. Not only are we blocked from seeing who was exactly activating her information, but we must take into consideration that this location was used on purpose by the user whether it be a kidnapper or even Susie herself. The user might have known this specific ATM was protective of identity and could only be traced by GPS rather than facial profiling. In the grand scheme of things, the ATM controversy is certainly the biggest case point, but also a fruitless trail of conspiracy and confusion rather than telling us anything useful at all besides the fact that someone involved was risking their plan at 4 p.m. on March the 3rd. Since the day Suzanne Lyle went missing, the ATM conspiracy sparked up and her name tag was discovered in the parking lot near Collins Circle. Countless theories have been proposed across the internet and publications all over the world, trying to unlock the secrets of the seemingly unexplainable mystery. The most popular theory centered around Susie's longtime boyfriend Richard Kahn, despite his alibi, clearing him of any potential guilt or wrongdoing. Followers of the case stuck with their gut feelings. Many pointed out that he was the only other party to have Susie's bank account pin in his possession and would probably be aware of a $20 withdrawal pattern. However, as previously mentioned, anyone could force Susie to share the pin under the right circumstances. And it wouldn't make any sense for Richard to leave such an obvious clue behind when people knew he would use the ATM at will. Because so many kidnappings and murders involved two familiar parties, Richard was an easy target due to his close connection with Susie. They did initially meet over the internet, which immediately drew red flags for Susie's parents. Doug Lyle described Richard as an incredibly intelligent individual mature beyond his years and devoted to he and Susie's relationship. Mary Lyle thought he was too clingy and a controlling boyfriend, always checking in on Susie in the evening and accessing her computer from his own, violating what most would see as an invasion of privacy. In fact, a few internet conspirators proposed that Richard hacked the Stewart's shop ATM from his computer to supposedly throw off investigators. Regardless of Richard's perceived characteristics, Susie never outwardly complained of his persistence or overbearing personality. Police weren't ever 100% willing to give up on Richard as a suspect, though. After a couple of months of investigation and around the time that Nike Man theories went up in flames, police attempted to conduct a second round of interviews with Richard. However, Richard refused this time, citing he wouldn't talk anymore without a lawyer present, and rejected a request to take a lie detector test without any actual evidence connecting Richard to Susie's disappearance. Authorities took this as a sign to move on. Yet the same persistent conspirators, both online and in person, viewed Richard's later absence to be a potential admittance of guilt. In rebuttal, it's important to remember that Richard fully cooperated with all questioning in the first round. Police questioning is not an enjoyable process, and having to deal with a heated interrogation with an already established alibi couldn't have been very helpful to the search anyways. Polygraph tests are also incredibly unreliable and often inaccurate. It would make sense for Richard to fear that his own anxieties and nerves bubbling up during an interview would skew the lie detector test and falsely imply his guilt. A common issue seen in criminal investigations throughout the years. When one thinks about the point at which police went back to Richard, it becomes obvious that after the nightmare suspect fell through, authorities were desperate for a concrete lead or a new suspect and figured Richard to be a probable receptor. In the end, Richard maintained his innocence throughout the process, eventually remarried and moved on from the case entirely. A couple of other potential suspects were considered at one point or another, although both were cleared almost as fast as they were uncovered. One of the suspects wasn't profiled as a specific person, but instead hypothetically drawn up from a very similar case exactly 13 years prior to Susie's disappearance. In March 1985, 
Another sunny Albany undergraduate student named Karen Wilson was last seen getting off a public transit bus one mile away from campus, much like Susie's vanishing. An intense surge bore no evidence or traces of current, leaving the case just as cold. When combing through other criminal records in the upstate New York area, police also came across documents from an anonymous convicted rapist who just so happened to be on the move at the exact same time Susie disappeared. However, upon extraditing the fellow from Illinois back to New York for questioning, he revealed a solid alibi and was excluded from any further consideration. Another convicted criminal was reckoned to be a suspect seven years later in 2005 when a man named John Reagan faced trial for the attempted abduction of a female high school student in 1993. The kidnapping occurred on the streets close to Saratoga Springs High School, just a short distance away from the Miles' hometown of Boston Spa. Both Susie's parents and investigators thought the similarities of the cases were peculiar and attempted to question John about any possible involvement. Unfortunately, John refused to discuss any outside cases with authorities and ended up in jail for his own crime. Police skeptically crossed his name off the list. One of the biggest theories churned from the mystery is one that many people are afraid to consider and do not want to discuss. The fact that Suzanne Lyle might have left on her own accord. While there is no explicit evidence that confirms such a belief, it must be considered in a case with no solid rhyme or reason. Susie was a very private person with little social interaction. She had her boyfriend, her family members, and her co-workers, but that was about it, at least to our knowledge. It's important to remember she spent a lot of time on the internet, connecting virtually to a whole other community. That's how she met Richard in the first place, so it's not out of the realm of possibility that she met others in anonymous message boards. What if she met a group of people that persuaded her to leave? While incredibly unlikely, there wasn't anything forcing her to stay in the Albany area. In the same vein, Susie's mother said multiple times that Susie was living paycheck to paycheck and specifically worried about her funds in the days leading up to a disappearance. Mary even tried to loan a little money, but Susie was quick to reject the offer. Another internet-related possibility was Susie found an alternative method to make money or received an offer she couldn't refuse from someone out there in the web. If it were far away from home, she would most certainly need a little money to supplement the journey, which would explain the frequent ATM withdrawals both on the 2nd and on the 3rd of March. Everyone wants to say that someone must have coaxed the account pin from Susie and used the machine themselves. But because Susie was one of only two people to know the security number, it was Susie herself to make the withdrawals. Both Doug and Mary Lyle agree that their daughter was a creature of habit and wouldn't venture away from a normal way of life. Which, on one hand, explained the consistency of the $20 money orders, but also makes one question why she'd make such a drastic decision to leave home. It would also be very cold-hearted to leave without telling a single soul, but also to send her mother a birthday card, seeming to imply that she would see her soon. On the other hand, it's more likely that Susie had a secret mission only she knew about and was kidnapped or worse somewhere along the way. She very easily could have wanted to remain quiet about an errand or internet-related task but ran into trouble without anyone knowing. This would still explain the random ATM usage and why she disappeared without a trace while leaving her possessions behind. The argument against such a claim and the biggest wrinkle in the entire Suzanne Lyle case is the employee name tag found in the parking lot near Collins Circle, two months after the disappearance. If Susie left on her own accord, why in the world would she or her kidnapper come back to the sunny Albany campus to place her name tag near the place she was last seen? The only reasonable thought is that Susie dropped it off after departing the bus and rerouting to another destination other than her dorm considering the parking lot in which the tag was found is in the opposite direction of Susie's living quarters. Some reports have stated that the name tag found isn't even the one she would have been wearing the night she worked last. It's also peculiar that the clue wasn't even discovered until two days after she went missing. If the sunny Albany campus was combed by investigators as rigorously as they maintained it was, the whole scenario is as mind-boggling as the case itself, leaving most theories up in the air. When looking at the big picture, it's nearly impossible to confidently give a solid conclusion regarding Suzanne Lyle's mysterious disappearance. However, taking everything into consideration, only one theory truly makes sense. Susie was taken by someone only she knew, anonymous to even her closest friends and family.
This hypothesis stems from two major clues hinted out by Susie's co-workers and her mother. The co-worker revealed early on in the search that Susie had mentioned she felt she was being followed by an unknown figure but wasn't worried, meaning it could have been someone she either vaguely recognized or wasn't even sure it was a stalker. Then Mary Lyle shared she believed Susie had been seeing someone outside of Richard due to a little bit of strange behavior and the crumbling connection with her ex-boyfriend. Both propositions are quite possible, and while neither can be confirmed, they would both play intricate roles in a possible kidnapping and could easily be connected to one another. How did Susie know this theoretical person? The internet? Records indicate that police did a technical analysis of Susie's computer, but whether or not they saw surprising history or frequented message boards is unknown. Even if they did, it's not difficult to hide virtual relationships that aren't tethered to a physical hard drive. If Susie was indeed up to something with somebody she wanted to keep a secret, the internet was probably her only communication. Inclusion of the fact that Susie was incredibly gifted with computer science and a longtime internet user only legitimizes this theory. She could have hidden this information from Richard, who had access to her files and took the secret with her. We've also concluded that the prime mystery at Collins Circle didn't actually happen at Collins Circle at all, but instead occurred as an unspecific location between the Crossgates Mall and sunny Albany campus. This conclusion arises from the lack of assurance in supposed eyewitness sightings of Susie after she clocked off work. The night security guard of the mall said nothing was out of the ordinary in the back employee parking lot and the bus driver of the specific vessel that picked up Susie on the night of March the 2nd confirmed that he saw a person get on board at 9.20 p.m. However, the assurances stop after that. The bus driver never remembers Susie exiting the bus at Collins Circle, only that she got off before the last stop. In addition, the student who claims to have seen Susie on campus at 9.45, the night she vanished, only thought she saw Susie and was interviewed an entire 48 hours after the fact. These wobbly, unsure sightings are too fragile to believe with certainty. In terms of after boarding the bus, we believe Susie met with her contact in the Albany suburbs and was either abducted that night or sometime during the following day. She was most likely meeting a secret lover or virtual friend, probably needing money to explain her random withdrawals throughout the afternoon and was then forced to take out more the following day after the suspect showed their true colors. Explaining the ATM withdrawals on March the 3rd. The perpetrator probably strategized using an ATM without a dependable security camera and utilized the Stewart shop hidden machine out of the view of CCTV. We believe Susie was still alive on March the 3rd and was the person to actually use the bank pin since it had been entered incorrectly only once, and her usual $20 amount was withdrawn. After this moment, while under the threat of her captor, Susie's fate dissolved into darkness. She never returned to campus as her tap card for the dormitory wasn't used after March the 2nd. In terms of the mysterious name tag found in the sunny Albany parking lot, we figure the true perpetrator discovered that was the assuming location of Susie's last confirmed activity a couple of months after the initial disappearance. So they thought of an item that would link to Susie, clean to her work name tag, travel back to the campus, and placed it near the Collins Circle bus stop, all to try and keep authorities on the wrong trail. It may seem like an unnecessary and extensive team, but the clues lack plausibility in the first place and fit within the ultimate findings. We are confident she intended to resume her normal life after the meeting within a stranger, resting in the facts that she told her mother in her birthday card. See you soon. What eventually happened to Suzanne Lyle will not be speculated to save her case from the endless pits of inconsiderate conspiracy theory. Her parents have attempted the same grace and through finding the positives of such a confusing tragedy, have managed to sustain laws regarding the time period state and federal law enforcement investigate missing persons cases. Young adults like Susie, specifically college students, have historically been mishandled when reportedly missing, and the Lyles' legal efforts have made their daughter's age group just as much a priority as young children. It's regular people like us who can help aid these programs and help fight the growing number of missing persons cases. We wouldn't report this if we didn't think it could help to remind the world, spread awareness, and potentially help bring a new clue or lead to the forefront of the search. Until we find her. Susie will remain a symbol of inspiration and remembrance. It's important not to forget that before her case froze, she was a human being, 
a woman with a future in computer science and a leader in technology advancement in the 21st century. She was quietly bright, with an intelligence unlike any of her peers. Her dedication to poetry and creativity sparked a light across all she came into contact with. And we hope that light continues to shine again here soon. Until then, the search continues as we push for persuasiveness and fight for answers to the disappearance of Suzanne Lyle and the mystery at Colin Circle. Mary Shotwell Little, born January 14, 1940, was a newlywed and 25 years old when she disappeared from Atlanta, Georgia in October 1965. She worked as a secretary at C and S Bank and had married just six weeks before her disappearance to Roy Little, a bank examiner training to be an auditor. On October 14th, Roy was out of town on a work-related trip, and Mary was preparing a party to welcome him back home. After work, Mary stopped for groceries and had dinner with a co-worker at Linwood Square Shopping Center in the Bookhead neighborhood of Atlanta. She appeared to be in good spirits and spoke happily about married life. Around 8 p.m., she left her colleague, saying she'd see them the next day. This was the last confirmed sighting of Mary. When Mary didn't show up for work the next day and didn't call in sick, her boss and colleagues became concerned. Her boss spoke to the co-worker she dined with, who mentioned seeing Mary's metallic pearl gray 1965 Mercury Comet with Georgia license plate number 282 in the parking lot. However, when the boss asked the shopping center security to locate the car, they couldn't find it. When the boss returned, he found the car exactly where the colleague said it would be. Several strange clues surrounded Mary's vehicle. Firstly, it had a coating of red dust on its exterior, suggesting it had been driven down a dirt road. Secondly, there were unusual contents inside. The groceries from the previous evening were still there, along with several pieces of Mary's clothing. Her slip underwear, and girdle were neatly folded and placed on the console between the front seats. Her bra and stocking were found on the floor, the latter cut, likely with a knife. Traces of blood were found on the clothing and smeared in various parts of the car. Investigators noted a minimal amount of blood, comparable to that of a nosebleed. Bloody fingerprints were found on the steering wheel. Although limited blood testing was available in 1965, the blood found in the car matched Mary's blood type, leading to the presumption that it was hers. The case took an even stranger turn. Mary's bank card was used twice in North Carolina. On October 15th, it was used in Charlotte and then in Raleigh. Attendants at both locations recalled a woman with a small head injury and bloodstains on her head and legs. She appeared to be with one or two middle-aged men who seemed to be directing her. She didn't ask for help and attempted to hide her face from the attendants. The time between credit card usage was 12 hours, though the distance between the two cities was only two to three hours. Mary's car had a North Carolina license plate, which came from a recently stolen car. Investigators suspected this was why the car hadn't been initially spotted by security. It was speculated that the car was hidden on October 14th and returned to its parking spot on October 15th. A $20,000 ransom demand was made to Roy, but when an FBI agent went to make the drop, they found an empty piece of paper at the designated location. The ransom demand was considered likely to be a cruel hoax. Numerous theories surrounded Mary's case. Suspicions initially fell on Roy, her husband, but he was eventually ruled out as a suspect. Mary had reportedly received odd phone calls and flowers from a secret admirer, but the identities behind these gestures remained unknown. Friends revealed that Mary expressed fear of being alone at home and driving unaccompanied before her disappearance. The case took a more bizarre turn when it was suggested that Mary might have been involved in uncovering a scandal at her workplace involving sexual harassment and a potential prostitution ring, possibly leading to her disappearance. Despite various theories and investigations, Mary Shotwell Little's disappearance remains unsolved. The case file went missing, and Mary has not been seen or heard from since. Her father passed away in 1979, but her mother continues the search for answers. Tracy Nelson, who should have been celebrating her 21st birthday, was tragically found stabbed to death in her apartment by her husband, Jeff, on January 5, 1981. While Jeff was out purchasing a birthday gift for Tracy, she remained at home. Her friend's attempts to wish her a happy birthday went unanswered, 
as they presumed she was occupied with her busy life. The shocking truth was that Tracy had been murdered. She had sustained multiple slash wounds above the waist, and her throat had been slit. Despite the lack of signs of struggle or forced entry in the apartment, the case presented several peculiar clues. Tracy's tortoise-colored keyring with her name on it was taken from her home, leading investigators to suspect the killer held onto it as a trophy. A sketch of the keyring, a 1-inch by 4-inch rectangle, has been released in hopes of prompting information. Another bizarre discovery was the Southwestern Bell Cable logbook found in Jeff and Tracy's home. The logbook indicated that work on Tracy's cable had been scheduled for that day at 11.51 a.m., but further investigation revealed that no cable repair company was slated to be there. It's theorized that the murderer might have used this book to gain access to Tracy's home without arousing suspicion. Despite authorities following up on 1,600 leads and discovering a single unidentified fingerprint in the apartment, two witness accounts describing potential suspects in the area have not led to successful leads. Descriptions of the men varied slightly, with details about their physical appearance differing between the two accounts. These unsettling clues have not resulted in any definitive breakthroughs, and the case of Tracy Nelson remains unsolved almost four decades later. Craig Price, dubbed by the media as the Warwick Slasher, was just 13 years old when he committed his first murder. On October 11, 1973, in Rhode Island, little is known about Craig's family life and upbringing. What is known is that from a young age, he had a juvenile record that included charges of robbery, stalking, assault, and drug use. Despite his questionable criminal record, nobody expected the young boy to take a life. On July 27, 1987, Craig broke into the home of 27-year-old Rebecca Spencer, a woman who lived just two doors down from him, and stabbed her 58 times with a kitchen knife. Then, on September 1, 1989, when Craig was 15, he broke into the home of 39-year-old Joan Heaton, who lived there with her two daughters, with the intent to rob them. Under the influence of weed and LSD at the time, he stabbed Joan 57 times, her 10-year-old daughter Jennifer 62 times, and her 8-year-old daughter Melissa 30 times. Melissa also suffered a crushed skull as Craig struck her with a kitchen stool. He even bit Joan and one of the girls. The attack was so aggressive that the blades of the knives he used broke off from the handles and remained inside the victim's bodies. Despite living near both crime scenes and having a juvenile record, police didn't consider him a suspect until the FBI linked both crimes, suggesting they were likely committed by someone nearby and who had injured his hand in the struggle. On September 5, 1989, during an interview, the 15-year-old's cut hand was noticed by two police officers. Craig claimed he cut it while drunk and failed a polygraph test. This led to a search warrant for his home, where bloody clothes and knives were found. Upon discovery, Craig remained calm and confessed without further pressing, lacking remorse. Even more disturbing, he mimicked the sounds of his victims dying as he confessed to the crimes. He attributed his actions to early exposure to violence. Arrested a month before his 16th birthday, he boasted about making history, having been tried and convicted as a juvenile and set to be released at 21. However, his case led to changes in laws, allowing juveniles to be charged as adults, though this couldn't be applied retroactively. Citizens opposed to the release of Craig Price lobbied for his imprisonment due to the brutal nature of the crime. Several state psychologists agreed that he was a poor candidate for rehabilitation. While in prison, Craig faced charges for criminal contempt, extortion, assault, and probation violations. These crimes ensured he wouldn't see freedom on his 21st birthday. Despite being denied parole in 2009 and being set for release in 2022, in April 2017, he was accused of stabbing another inmate and was sentenced to a further 25 years in January 2019. At 46 years old, Rhode Island can rest assured that the Warwick Slasher will remain behind bars for life. The Babes in the Wood In 1987, Russell Bishop was found not guilty of the murders of Karen Hathaway and Nicola Fellows, who were both only nine years old. Their bodies have been found less than a mile from their brightened homes in a dense, wooded area known as Wild Park. They had both been sexually assaulted and strangled. 
Bishop volunteered himself in the search for the missing schoolgirls and was one of the first people to arrive on the scene. Bishop's thin partner and mother of his children said that a sweatshirt found at the murder scene was his, but the trial fell apart when she later retracted this claim. Bishops continued to protest his innocence and pleaded with the police to find the real perpetrator so that he could clear his name. But just three years later, Bishop was back on trial again, this time for the attempted murder of a seven-year-old girl who he snatched off the streets of Brighton and shoved into the boot of his car. He drove her to a wooded area, sexually assaulted her, and after strangling the young girl left her for dead. Luckily, she survived the attack and proved to be an exceptional witness. At the Idaho parade, Bishop tried to disguise himself by wetting his hair, but the girl picked him out anyway. He was charged with attempted murder, kidnap, and sexual assault. The court found him guilty and sentenced him to life imprisonment. Even though Bishop was safe behind bars, detectives never gave up their fight to get justice for Karen and Nicola. In 2005, the double jeopardy law was scrapped in the UK, meaning that Bishop could be retried for the double murder, even though he'd already been acquitted once. In this second trial, the prosecution was able to link DNA evidence taken from the sweatshirt to both of the girls and Bishop. They were also able to prove by a billion to one chance that a sample taken from Karen's arm matched the DNA profile of Russell Bishop. Of course, none of this forensic ever was available at the first trial in 1987. Bishop tried to explain away the evidence by saying that when involved in the search for the schoolgirls, he had touched both bodies at the crime scene to try and find a pulse. However, two witnesses who were teenagers at the time testified that Bishop didn't go anywhere near the bodies during the search. In December 2018, Bishop was sentenced to life again the Old Bailey in London, with a minimum term of 36 years. He will be 82 before he can be considered for release. It had taken 32 years, but new. Forensic evidence had finally won justice for the families of the babes in the wood. Linda O'Keefe the photograph of 11-year-old Linda O'Keefe had been hanging on the wall of the Newport Beach Police Department for 45 years. It was kept there as a reminder for officers never to forget her unsolved murder. Linda went missing on the 6th of July, 1973, while walking home from summer school in Southern California. She was seen talking to a stranger in a turquoise van before she vanished. The body was found dumped in a ditch the following day. She had been sexually assaulted and strangled. In the summer of 2018, police began publishing a series of tweets on Twitter that were written as though they had been posted by Linda herself. The tweets told the story of her murder and asked for help to find her killer. Please use evidence collected at the crime scene to produce a DNA profile that could predict the killer's skin, hair, and eye color. Then they made a sketch of what he might have looked like if he was aged 25 in 1973 and what he might look like now. After these sketches were released on Twitter, the authorities said they received a significant lead. They turned to a genealogy website that allows users to submit their own DNA samples to search for relatives and ancestors. They got a hit, and 72-year-old James Neal was arrested in Colorado in January of 2019. Alistair Wilson, a 30-year-old residing in Nairn, Northeast Scotland, in 2004, was married to Veronica for six years and had two young children. Working as a banker, he was set to start a new job in two weeks. Unfortunately, Alistair never got to realize his new goals. On November 28, 2004, while Alistair and his family were at home with friends, the doorbell rang. Veronica went to answer it, assuming it was their friend arriving early to pick up their baby. A stranger stood at the door, addressing Alistair by name. Unalarmed, Veronica fetched her husband, assuming it was work-related. She continued reading bedtime stories to the kids while Alistair headed downstairs. The conversation between Alistair and the stranger lasted several minutes, its contents unknown. Alistair returned looking perplexed, not fearful, holding a bright blue envelope addressed to Paul. Puzzled, Veronica let him return downstairs to find the man, who was still at the doorstep. Several gunshots echoed. Panicked, Veronica ran to her husband as he lay injured, but he died an hour later in the hospital. The blue envelope had disappeared. Ten days later, a maintenance worker found an antique gun in a nearby drain, confirmed as the murder weapon, yet without the killer's DNA. The murderer, 
described as white, stocky, 5 feet 6 inches to 5 feet 10 inches, around 35 to 40 years old, wore a dark baseball cap and a jacket. The police sketch remains unreleased, contributing to the mystery of Alistair's unsolved murder, later termed the doorstep murder. Speculations vary. A hired hitman, criminal debts, mistaken identity, or a purpose for the blue envelope. Online discussions ponder whether Alistair was supposed to place something in the envelope, theorizing that he was shot because he didn't comply. The absence of an explanation for the envelope's contents or the Paul label remains a question. The murder remains unsolved, leaving Veronica in the same house, raising her children without their father. Graham Frederick Young, born in Middlesex, England in September of 1947, was fascinated by poisons from a young age. His interest quickly turned sinister when he began to experiment on the people around him, but it took a long time for Graham to finally be caught and put behind bars for good. In 1961, Graham began to poison his family so he could study the effects the substances had on the human body. He started with his stepmother, 37-year-old Molly, who suffered unexplained vomiting, diarrhea, and stomach pains. His father, Fred, aged 44, soon followed in her footsteps. Then finally, Graham's sister Winifred began to feel the effects, as did several of his friends. Graham fell ill too, but to a lesser degree. It's not known if this was intentional or an accident. Later in November 1961, Winifred was served tea by Graham, and she took only one mouthful before spitting it out as it tasted sour. On her morning commute, she found herself hallucinating and was sent to the hospital where it was discovered that she had been exposed to atropine, belladonna's trope also known as Deadly Nightshade, a plant extremely toxic when ingested. When Fred confronted his son about this, Graham retaliated by blaming his sister for mixing her shampoos in the teacups. Fred found nothing incriminating in his son's bedroom, but told him to be more careful. It was only six months later, on April 20, 1962, that Molly Young died from poisoning, and Fred was taken to the hospital where he was told that just one more dose of poison would have killed him. On the back of this turn of events, Graham's aunt became suspicious of him, as did his science teacher, who found bottles of poisons in his desk and reported it to the school principal. Graham was sent to a psychiatrist and was arrested on May 23, 1962. He confessed to the attempted murder of Fred, Winifred, and one of his friends. Molly's death was not considered suspicious given that she'd sustained a prolapse of her spinal bone in a traffic accident and there was no way for investigators to check her cause of death as she'd been cremated at Graham's suggestion. The 15-year-old was detained under the Mental Health Act at Broadmoor Hospital and was subsequently diagnosed with a personality disorder and schizophrenia. Later analysis of Graham's behaviors and personality indicated he may also have been on the autism scale too. In 1970, Graham told the hospital psychiatrist that he was no longer obsessed with poison and violence. But in secret, he was studying medical texts and experimenting on inmates and staff, one of whom died due to his investigations. A year later, in February 1971, Graham was released, supposedly fully recovered. He got a job at a laboratory, which was not informed of his past conviction, and his probation officer never checked in with him. Not long after, the now 24-year-old started work, his foreman became ill and died. Cygna swept through his workplace and was mistaken for a virus. Some of his colleagues even required hospitalization. It seemed Graham Young's famous tea was making its rounds again. It's believed about seven people were non-fatally poisoned, and after the new foreman became sick, he quickly quit the job. Another workmate became Graham's fourth and final victim. Suspiciously, Graham asked the company doctor if thallium had been considered, and he told one of his colleagues that he studied chemicals as a hobby. Alarmed, the workmates then went to the police with this information, leading to Graham's second arrest on November 21, 1971. Authorities found several poisons on his person and in his home, plus a diary that noted the dose's effects and whether he'd let someone live or die. Despite the evidence stacking up against him, Graham pleaded not guilty, claiming that the diary was simply a fantasy novel. This did not wash with a jury who convicted him, and he was sentenced to life in prison. Behind bars, Graham befriended the infamous Ian Brady, the Scottish serial killer, who was one half of the guilty party behind the Moors' murders. They shared an obsession with Nazis and Hitler. 
Graham died one month before his 43rd birthday in August 1990 from a heart attack. He is known as the Central Bend's Poisoner and the Teacup Poisoner. Graham Young's disturbing crimes provoked a copycat in November 2005 when a 16-year-old Japanese schoolgirl was arrested for poisoning her mother with Valium. She claimed she was fascinated with Graham, having seen the 1995 black comedy film about his life called The Young Poison's Handbook. She kept an online blog like Graham kept a diary, although no recent updates can be found. Her mother was in a coma in 2005. Sandy Charles, born in 1980 in northern Saskatchewan, there didn't appear to be anything odd or unusual about Canadian boy Sandy Charles. While there's little documented about his life before his crime, it seems apparent that nobody thought he was a child to be concerned about. All that changed in 1995. At 14 years old, Sandy was fascinated with the 1989 movie Warlock and watched it repeatedly. The horror film, rated for ages 15 and above, suggests that if a person drinks liquefied fat of an unbaptized child, they can fly or gain special powers. There is little information as to how Sandy conceived his plan, but on July 8, 1995, he stabbed a boy with a knife, beat him with a beer bottle and a rock, then cut strips of his skin from him and boiled them down. His victim was Jonathan George Timpson, born on December 30, 1987, described as playful and outgoing. The seven-year-old's hero was the masked crusader Zaro. Jonathan's body was found just a few days later on July the 11th in the woods a few hundred yards from his grandma's house. His head had been crushed and his throat had been slashed. 10 to 15 strips had been carved out from his skin. Sandy had an eight-year-old accomplice named William Martin, who was too young to be tried at the time, but it's unknown what his role was in the killing. While it's unclear what evidence led police to Sandy Charles's doorstep, he was later convicted as an adult and sent to a psychiatric hospital, having been found not guilty by reason of insanity in August of 1996. Sandy had told police officers, there's a spirit in my room which gave me these thoughts. Reportedly, the 14-year-old had been contemplating suicide when a voice told him that it might be just as good to kill someone else. He was later diagnosed as a schizophrenic. It was discovered that Sandy had ultimately suffocated Jonathan after a failed attempt at breaking the young boy's neck. A knife was also found lodged in Jonathan's eye. Sources conflict on whether or not Sandy consumed the boiled down fat, which he'd taken and cooked from Jonathan's body. Allegedly, he said that he did not drink it as he just wanted to stay the way he was. In June 2000, at the age of 17, Sandy attacked a prison nurse but only spent one day in solitary confinement as punishment. In 2014, he told the court that he wanted to be socialized enough to re-enter society, but his request to move to a different institute was denied. It's unlikely that Sandy Charles will be released from the psychiatric hospital in which he resides. Let us know your thoughts in the comment section, and don't forget to subscribe to our channel.